tale of two sons. Oops, that would be nice if you would record it. So it's the tale of two sons, which you obviously understand will be the story of Jacob and Esau. But I want to tell it from a point of view that's probably a little bit different. I want to talk to you from the point of view of a principal, somebody who has the kids in school. And I, I think Esau gets a bad rap. And also does Jacob being called a supplanter and all of the other things that goes with it, because there's I think there's more to the story than what we can actually see. Because you see these three chapters that go together cover 70 years of their of their lives. So in 70 years, having whatever, 200, 100 verses, you don't get an understanding of everything that's going on. It, it's, it's pinpointing different kinds of things. So I, I want you to, to understand that, you know, when Rebecca and, and Isaac marry, it was not a fairy tale romance. It was a planned wedding. But beyond that, I think it's also important to understand that Rebecca was not born until the day Sarah died, according to the Midrashic writings. Now, according, if that is true, Isaac is going to be 40 years old when he marries Rebecca, but Rebecca is going to be three years old. Now, imagine the, the differences in age. Also, understand the communities that they're from. Because you see, the communities are quite different. Rebecca is obviously from Haran, which is where Abraham started his journeys from. She's the granddaughter of Nahor, which was Abraham's uh, brother. And Isaac is really from Hebron. But when we witness him coming into our picture today, he's not coming from Hebron, he's coming from Jerusalem. So there's a lot of things to take into consideration, but the first thing I want you to understand is there's really an age difference between the two. Not that Rebecca is totally immature, but at three years old, her maturity level cannot be what you would consider an adult. And so we're going to see some changes as she goes through growing up because she literally grows up married and so there's going to be quite a difference in how we're going to perceive what she sees the world as as to what we understand the world to be now we always when we go through this i want you to turn to chapter 24 and go to verses 65 to 67 that's where we'll start those are the last couple of verses of the story Sixty-five begins, and she said to the servant, who is the man walking in the field? Now, the word for field here is the word machon, and it's ha machon, the field. Whenever the word the field was used in the stories in the Tanakh, they were talking about Jerusalem, and they were talking about the Temple Mount. They were talking about the place where Isaac had been offered up on as an as a offering at that point so here he is coming back from that same area at that point in time now the servant said and that was eliezer he is my master she then took the veil and covered herself the servant told isaac all the things that he had done and isaac brought her into into the tent of sarah his mother he married Rebecca and she became a wife and he loved her and thus was Isaac consoled after his mother's death. Okay, so we understand now, first off, he's coming not from Hebron where they're now going to live, but he's coming from that mountain area. In coming, he's walking across this open area. And as he's walking across this open area, she spies him and says, who is it? He said, this is Isaac. This is my, this is who you came to marry. What is her first reaction? She covers her face. So the question is, why does she cover her face? Here she is, she's only three years old. Why is she covering her face? Is it that the ritual? No. It appears as though, from reading the, the writings, she's actually embarrassed. 
And so she covers her face because remember, Isaac is, if we were going into the levels of spiritualness, Isaac's spiritual level would be far superior to hers. And it was intimidating. And so she covers her face and Eliezer continues the conversation. And eventually Isaac takes her into Sarah's tent. Now, when she's in Sarah's tent, we have to understand there were several stories that, that focused on Sarah's tent. And one of them was that according to the writings, that tent, when she lit the Shabbat candles, would remain lit all week long. One of the miracles that occurred again when she began to sleep in that tent was the candles burnt all week long. And so there was a, a connection between Isaac and Rebecca through the mother at that point in time. Now, as we go through this then, we're going to see that there's going to be a marriage and there's going to be after the marriage, there's going to be a problem with getting pregnant. She will get pregnant, but according to the writings and go to chapter 23, verses 25 and 26, going backwards. Oh, I missed, I miswrote it. It's gotta be later on 20. Well, anyway, let me tell you what I'm understanding. At the point in time in which she becomes pregnant, she will be 23 years old. Isaac will be 60 years old. There's still that age gap. There's still that maturity level. And we also have to understand the, the relative spiritualness of Isaac. Isaac was a man of study. He was a man who focused on his studies. He didn't need to, he dug wells. He didn't need to do a lot of work because that would be done by all the servants that they had at that point in time. So she finds herself pregnant. We know that she went to somebody in order to find out what was going on because she became embarrassed by what was happening within her. Now, according again, the writings, she went to see Shem or Melchizedek. And he told her that there were two nations warring within her. And so as the story goes on, then she keeps quiet about it. She doesn't tell anybody what's going on, but just allows it to happen. Now, as we go through this, we begin to understand that there's a growing process. The children being Jewish in their nature, in the sense that Isaac is going to continue to teach them. And according to the writings, he would be teaching between 10 and 12 hours a day. Now, I'm a principal who has enough trouble keeping kids on track for six hours a day, let alone 10. But you also have to understand all kids aren't alike. And because all kids aren't alike, you're going to find that there's going to be some kids listening to somebody talk and to read for 10 hours is not going to hold their attention. And we also begin to understand their personalities begin to show. And the personality of Jacob, that was fine. He was a bookworm. He was a people pleaser. Esau was kind of a people pleaser, but he was a man of the fields. He was a man who wanted to be outside. He, he was a hunter and a fisher. That's where his life was. Studying the Torah, or what was the Torah at that time, 10 hours a day, wasn't what he wanted to do with his life. but. He was a part of the family, and so he continued that way. And so everything went on, but he was one of those rough and tumble kids who would rather be outside. The next time we see them is when they are 15 years old. Now, at 15, we have to go to chapter 25, and we're going to go down to the text itself, and we're going to go to the level to verse 29 to 34. He begins by saying, Jacob simmered a stew and Esau came in from the field. Now they're 15 years old. Here's Jacob cooking stew. Well, it's not stew, he's cooking lentils. Lentils was the meal of mourning. 
somebody that died. So at the age of 15, they're now experiencing death. So the question becomes, who died? And the answer was Abraham. Now, some say Abraham died early, prematurely, because he didn't, God did not want him to see what Esau was going to become. But there's more to that than, than I think that part says. Because you see, I think grandpa had a great influence on Esau's life. There are many families that I've had at school where the children cling to their grandparents more than they do their parents. They have more of a bond, more of a relationship with them. And I think Esau had a great relationship with Abraham. The death of Abraham appears to, at some point, shock him. Although it doesn't sound like it, because as you read through the text, notice what it says. So he came hunting, a man of the field, but Jacob was a wholesome man. So you get a difference between the two. They're, they're already talking. We're already looking at differences. He abides in the tent. Well, Isaac loved Esau for the game that was in his mouth, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Think of what Isaac likes about his son. What is the most, what is the most relevant thing he says about him? I like the food that he makes. On the other hand, look at how Rebecca looks at Jacob. Jacob, I love. Now, Malachi, we see the verse that says, Jacob, I love, and Esau, have I hated. But that's, that's not exactly what it really is here. But we have to know that Jacob belonged to Rebecca, and Esau belonged to Isaac. Now, as, as we go through this, then we begin to understand that there's a lot of there's a lot of play between these two boys. They're not alike, nor can they really be treated alike. But as time goes on, we begin to see something else is happening. You see, on the day in which he comes into the tent, Esau comes in and finds out that his grandfather is dead. Would be a shocking day. But Prior to his coming in, according to the writings, he had raped a woman and killed a man. That was how he came in. So his mindset when he walks into the camp is not the mindset of somebody that's 15 years old. Although I've been around 15 year olds where that would be their mindset. He was off. But that's not the only things that, that, that seems to go wrong. Because notice what happens. He wants soup or he will faint and die. Would you faint and die because you didn't have enough soup? Having killed somebody and raped somebody, I would imagine you'd be pretty tired, which I think is really where his mind was at. But as he goes along with this story, as we begin to read the story, pour it into my mouth, I'm exhausted. That's what he meant. I'm exhausted. But as he goes on from there, he says, we understand the fact that this, this lentils that were poured into him were red. And so therefore he received the name Edom, which means red. But Esau also speaks to redness and the hairy redness that he was. Now, Jacob said, sell as this day your birthright. Sell your birthright to me. Barakah. Barakah. A birthright had meaning, but notice how he refines himself or how he speaks to Jacob afterwards. And he says, look, I'm going to die. I'm hungry. So what use is me to me is a birthright? So Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swore to him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew and he ate and he drank and got up and he left. What good is a birthright to me? Jacob has offered him, or he is giving away, his right to go into the world to come as the firstborn son. That's what he's giving away at this point in time. In giving that away, he's also telling us 
what he values the most, and that is this world. This world is about the pleasures that he can receive. That's what he's there for. And so as you go th along in this whole thing, we begin to see that there's no real connection between Esau and what's going on within the family camp in his mind. He's already separated himself. Now, according to the stories, Esau was very much like his grandfather. He, he, he had loving kindness. But at this point, it doesn't appear that it's now showing at all. And so we walk away from that. Now, the next time we read about Esau, he's 40 years old. So we go from 15 to 40. And so you got to look at chapter 26 and verse 35. Well, we can start in 34. When Isaac, or when Esau was 40 years old, he took a wife, Judith, daughter of Beri, the, the Hittite, and Basima, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they were the source of spiritual rebellion to Isaac and to Rebekah. Now, they lived in the area of Hebron, and Hebron was populated during the days of Abraham with Hittites. And so these two women would naturally be a part of that community that was there. So he married local girls. But he note the parents recognized right away that the girls were not really good for Esau. They saw that there was a spiritual darkness that was, was there. You see, the women seemed to persist in keeping into idolatry. Now it's said that one of the women or the, both of them, it doesn't really say. It's, it simply says that the smoke from the idols, from the burning of the offerings, caused Isaac to begin to go blind. So blindness now begins to show up. Now, as you remember, the event that we're going to see with the blessing, at the, with the uh, offering of the blessing, will occur much later in time. By then, it will be 20-some years later. So we're covering multiple skips in years. We aren't seeing the full picture. We're just seeing what we can. And then using my imagination and what happened with me for 30 years with kids, I come to the conclusion that he began to walk away from God at about 15. But he still had a sense of kindness that will show up because he now understands his mom and dad really disapproved of what he did. Now, he should have divorced both of them, but that's not what he did. He added a third wife to the, to the mix, a third wife. The wife that he added, her, her name, well, the name that they gave her was Mahat. And and the idea is, in, in this understanding, she was such that she was willing. She was a daughter of Ishmael, and she contains much of the seven laws. And so she was acceptable. But now he's got two wives that aren't and one life that is. Now, he tries to make the other ones acceptable, or at least one of them, because he calls her Yahudit, Yahudit. Now, Yahudi means anyone who denies idolatry is called a Yahudi. And so he's trying to tell them, well, she's changed. She's more, she's more like you guys. But that's not enough. You see, Rebecca has already put off Esau but she still loves Jacob. Can you see the story is splitting? Can you see how Esau is being walked out of the camp? Now his dad still likes him, but I don't sense the fact that his dad spent a lot of time with him. He was still in his spiritual world. And here's Esau who wants to be in the fields. Now, Mahat actually means forgiveness. 
And so Rashi says from the fact that he marries a, a girl of forgiveness, that when a Jewish wedding occurs, all of the sins of the marrying couple are forgiven and they start fresh. Now, Rabbi uh, Menachem Schneerson said, and I, I want to read his ideas. She was indeed a genuinely fine, this is Mahalik. She was indeed a genuinely fine and spiritual person. So why did, why did Esau marry her? On one level, he wanted to look good in his father's eyes. Notice in his father's eyes. Second, on another level, we come to the idea Esau had a spark of goodness which his father Isaac had really seen in him. And that's what really he loved. Now, eventually, through the course of history, that spark of good in Esau and his descendants will be revealed in the lineage of Esau at the end of days. So that goodness is, is now starting to come out because we're approaching the end. But as we go through this, we have to understand, well, let me back up a second. Let me talk to you about darkness. I don't know how many of you are into science and astronomy and, and those kinds of things, but I, I want to talk to you about dark matter. And I don't know if you know what dark matter is. Dark matter is something that is unseeable. It's almost hypothetical in its understanding because science can measure it, but it can't be seen and there's no way to track it. 85% of our universe is said to be filled with dark matter. 95% is filled with dark energy. Can you understand what's going on? It's a spiritual war as well as everything else. There is good in darkness. There's evil in darkness. And so this good and this evil show up in darkness. When God created the heavens and the earth, I don't know if you've ever read Dr. Uh, Gerald Schroeder's books on creation story. When we begin to create the story, we understand that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Kapawi, everything expanded from one place. That expansion began, and as it began, it was energy being released, energy that would look like a, a, a ball of energy. And as it released, it then began to separate. And what separated was dark and light. And that's our first day, was this separation. Well, if it wasn't for dark matter, when the constant, when the, uh, what am I looking for? The galaxies were created, there would nothing hold them together. The gravitational pull is not strong enough on everybody to hold it together. It's this dark matter, this dark energy that holds the, the universe together. So God is, uses good and evil. He uses dark and light in, in his whole process. And so when we're looking at this, we're beginning to see that Esau is talking about this light that's coming from Mahalat. And this light is good. And the parents probably sense that, although there's not a comment regarding it. Well, as we go further in, we understand then that through the course of history, this good is going to show up more and more in Esau's life. Now, Esau can't live forever. So we have to follow his generations. Now, there was a character, a character, it was a great scholar. His name was Vilna Gaon. And actually, that wasn't his name. His real name was Elijah ben Solomon uh, Zolman. He was a great, great scholar. And he made a statement that was very, very dumb. He said, you know, back in Genesis chapter 10, there are 70 nations mentioned. 35 of those nations, those are Esau nations. 35 of those nations were Ishmael nations. That's how they were divided. Well, Ishmael and, and Esau weren't even alive then. But what he was trying to talk about was the fact that they, 35 of them acted much like Esau and 35 acted much like Ishmael. Well, if we go back and look at the history of those two men, 
we have to understand something's going on. Now he demands soup. He demands it. Esau at that point in time at that dinner table was very materialistic. He had taken another man's wife. He had killed another man. He was very much worldly. He was a hunter. He was a man of the fields. All of the things that, that he was, was very much like the world today. You see the world today, and if you go across the United States, that's one of the things that characteristics that we notice, people are all about I. It's very, very materialistic. There is no world to come. There's, it's eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow I die. That was, the, that was the idea of Esau at the blessing, or at the, yeah, at, at the taking of the blessing, or not the blessing, but the, the birthright. Ishmael, on the other hand, was like his father Abraham in the fact that he was very religious. Problem. His religion bordered on fanaticism. We have the nations that are very much going one way, and we have the opposite, which are the fanatical religions, Islam. How many people are willing to commit suicide so that they can live with 70 virgins in the future? So many, and so many things are going wrong in the world today. You know, before Islam, in this last century or this last half century began to really build up. The world was governed by MAD. Russia and the United States both had nuclear missiles. Nobody else had them, or at least we didn't think they did. And what happened? If Russia thought about firing a missile, they knew that the United States would fire one right back. Mutual assured destruction. When Iran gets the missiles, what do we know about the Iranian spiritual insights? There is no such thing as mutual assured destruction. It is all about getting the enemy, and the enemy is Israel. The world may go up in flames, but the enemy will have killed off Israel. We know that, they, that Islam has lived for centuries off of who they can gather. And by gathering, it usually involves a war, a struggle. Now, as we go on with this, this understanding, it would be better to be a Jew in sub, sub, Siberia than to be a Jew in a suburb. That was an expression of the Rebbe. Why is it better to be a Jew in Siberia? Because you're left alone. You don't have to deal with either extreme. But in suburbia, you have two different groups. You have that group that is there, that is, would gladly assimilate you. Well, assimilation is what Israel fought over in the war we call Hanukkah. That's, a, that's the war of light. But then on the other side, the radicals, they're going the other way. And that's a war of Purim. Because you see, Haman wanted to destroy every single Jew. His plot, his plan began when he sat down to eat with uh, Ahasuerus. But it was defeated when he sat at the same table with Esther and Ahasuerus. Two different groups, two different worlds, both negative. But we go back to Esau. You see, Esau will change. The Greek Empire under Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes, that's the one where, where they be, Hanukkah was happening. He did not object to being a, for them to be Jews. He only objected to the fact that they had to have only one God. They needed more. That's why he slew the pig on the altar. That's why he killed so many people, because they would not give up one God. But you see, he came from the Greek area, which is a part of the Edomite empire. And so he was lumped into that group. Now, as we go on and we, we begin to look at what's happening, we have fanaticism on one side and assimilation on the other side. That's what's happening. I want you to go to the blessing itself. I want you to turn to chapter 27 
And I want you to look at the first four verses because this is going to be significant about what's going to happen. And then I want you to, to tell me or think about who actually was the supplanter here. 27.1 begins, and it came to pass when Isaac had become old. He's 122. Old. He'll live to be 165. But he thinks at this point he is dying. And his eyes were dim from seeing that he summoned Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son, he said to him, here I am, he said, see now I have aged and I know not the day of my death. Now sharpen, if you please, your gear, your sword and your bow, and go out into the field and hunt game for me. Then make me delicacies such as I love and bring that to me and I will eat so that I may, my soul may bless you before I die. So this is what he's talking about. He wants Esau to go slay a deer, venison. Now, it's not told exactly in the story, but understand this. He was such a great hunter that he could kill a deer in a kosher fashion. When you stop to think about meat in a kosher fashion, you have to understand it's about the slitting of the throat. Nobody can get close enough to a deer to slit their throat in a natural way. But with his bow and arrow, according to the writers, with his bow and arrow, he nicked the throat of the deer and it bled out. And he developed a very venison-like kosher deer. Now imagine how long this whole process is going to take. He's leaving his father's tent. He's going out looking for this, this deer, finding the deer. He slays the deer, makes sure it's in a kosher fashion, and then he comes back and he begins to create the meal. Look at verse 5. Now Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring. But Rebekah had said to Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard your father speaking to your brother Esau, saying, Bring me some game and make me delicacies to eat, and I will bless you in the presence of Hashem before my death. So now, my son, heed my voice, which I command you. Go now to the flock and fetch me from the two choice young kids of the goats, and I will make of them delicacies for your father as he loves then bring it to your father and he shall eat so that he may bless you before his death. Notice Jacob's reply. Jacob replied to Rebecca, his mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man and I am smooth skinned. Perhaps my father will recognize me. He's looking for an excuse. Why don't I want to do this? Who's the supplanter? It's Rebecca. Now think about this for a second. What kind of marriage? Sarah and Abraham had a marriage in which they could talk. Sarah knew that Ishmael did not belong in their household. She told Abraham to release him. Abraham didn't want to, but he finally listened and he listened to the voice of God. Here's Rebecca. She now has hears about her son being blessed, but not the right son. So she chooses to intervene. She was the supplanter. And the question then becomes, well, why? Well, who's her family? Where does she come from? Laban is her brother. Even in three short years, she had learned the process of deception from a very early age. Also remember, Esau is 37 years older than his wife, Rebecca. Now, what kind of a difference can that make in family discussions? I know better than you. 
there doesn't appear to be a family discussion. She doesn't come to Abraham or to Isaac and say, are you going to bless Jacob too? She takes it from her own understanding that there's only one blessing going to be given out and that's going to be given to Esau. So she wants to make sure that her son gets blessed because that's the one she really loves. There are many households that I've had to deal with where there was a difference of opinion and age also between the husband and the wife and the lack of communication between the two led to some terrible consequences for the kids. As I'm looking through the story, I, I'm reading a story about what it was like when I was a principal. I really am. So at this point, the boys are 62 years old. 62. Far older than we would have a mental picture. But they were 62 years old. Isaac was 122 at that point in time. So this is the, the consequences of, of what's going on. Now, we know that she steals, or Isaac, Isaac's blessing goes to Jacob. But I want you to see the tragedy in, in what's going on. So I want us to go to the blessing itself, and that's also in chapter 27. And it begins in verse number 28, okay? This is the blessing that he was going to give to Isaac that Jacob has now stolen. And may God give you the dew of the heavens and the fatness of the earth and abundant grain and wine. Those are the ingredients for Esau. Esau is about the earth. Esau is about the, the things that are grown. People will serve you and regimes will prostrate themselves to you and the Lord to your kinsmen and your mother's sons will prostrate themselves before you. Curse be those who curse you and bless be those who bless you. Well, bless those who bless you. That's, that's the third, that's the last of the seven blessings that Abraham received in chapter 12. But notice there's no spiritual blessing in this. The middle blessing simply says that your, your brother will prostrate himself before you. And that happened. Remember after the, the uh, Yarbak, after the, the defeat of Esau's angel by Jacob, when they approach Esau, Jacob and his family all bow down and Jacob calls Esau his Lord. Esau represents several kingdoms that we should know about. We should know about the kingdom of Greece and we should know about the kingdom of Rome and how the Jewish people still believe Rome exists in the form of the United States. Those were the kingdoms. Those were the ones who lorded over. Now, after this whole thing is done, we, we, we see that Isaac and Jacob or Isaac and, and Esau find themselves in a quandary. Can't you find a blessing for me? Can't you give me something out of this whole thing? So we look at verse number 29, I think. No, not 29. Goes further. Verse 39. Behold, the fatness of the earth shall be your dwelling, and of the dew of the heavens from above. By your sword you shall live, but your brother you shall serve. Now he turns it around. And yet it shall be that when you are aggrieved, you may cast off his yoke from upon your neck. So there will come a time when Esau will cast off Jacob. That's the point of the story. Again, notice there is nothing spiritual in everything that he's blessing him with. The blessing is all about physicalness. That's the world in which he lived. Now, Rebecca understands that, that obviously, obviously Esau is going to hate his brother even more. In fact, he'll want to kill him 
which she understands and she sees it closely. Well, after all, Jacob is a supplanter. Or was he? As we go through this story, go all the way down. Notice 28, chapter 28. Look at verse number that, uh, yeah, about the third verse. Isaac has told Jacob he's going to bless him and he's going to instruct him. And that he's not to take a wife from the Canaanites, which obviously was a problem before that he was to go to Laban's house and that's where he's going to find it. Now look at verse three. And may El Shaddai bless you, make you fruitful and make you numerous. May you be a congregation of peoples. May he grant you the blessings, the blessing of Abraham. That's chapters 12, one, two, and three. Do you see the spiritualness? This was the blessing that was going to be given to Jacob anyway. But Jacob stole the physical blessing. Now, it's going to end up okay. Because really what Isaac probably was thinking and he wanted to do was much like what happens between Zebulun and Ishakar. Jacob has two sons, Jacob, Zebulun and Ishakar. Zebulun was a, was a man of the world. He was a financier. He liked making money. Ishakar, on the other hand, was a religious man. He was one who studied the mysticals. Well, they created an agreement between the two of them. Ishakar would supply the money, or Zebulun would supply the money. Ishakar would supply the, the spiritualness. <clears throat> Excuse me would supply the spiritualness, the spiritual side to this. That appears to be what was in the mind of Isaac. But it didn't work out that way. But what will actually happen will be the fact that Isaac, through God's help, has made it so Israel finds itself, Israel being Jacob, finds himself self-sufficient. He becomes the world but he also becomes the spiritual side of the world. So in our story today, we've, we've read about a blessing. It's about events that are going to happen. Now, when Jacob is sent away to, to see Haran, to see Laban, or to see Laban, he goes much as Eliezer did. In other words, in order to find a wife, you had to pay for her. So Jacob had a dowry when he left Beersheba. But he arrives in Haran. He has no such money, no, no dowry, no nothing. So the question then becomes, well, what happened to it all? Well, the Midrashic writing says that what happened was that uh, Esau sent his son to kill Jacob. And the reason he sent his son is because he wanted to be at home so he can prove that he was not the one who killed him. And so he sends Eliphaz. Well, Eliphaz was willing to go, but eventually he will negotiate with Jacob. I'll take all your goods. That'll prove to my dad that you're dead and you go on without it. And if you starve to death, that's okay. But you won't have any money to spend on it. So the story leaves there. Eliphaz returns back, says he killed him, all of the things that are there. Jacob, on the other hand, doesn't go immediately to Haran, but instead goes to the tent of Melchizedek, Shem, and will spend 14 years there learning before going on, leading us into another story. By now, he's in his 80s as he arrives up there. Consider the amount of time that the Bible compresses into three chapters. When we try to understand everything we see, we can't just simply go by the passage size. We have to literally go back and find dates or find somebody who has a given piece of information that can help us place it together. 
So with that, I'm done. Anybody have a good thought or a question or an idea? Anybody want to argue with my principal thinking? Go ahead, Kelly. You're still muted. There, there you go. Okay. I have a question that's actually nope, been you on. still the... can't be heard. Can you hear her? You can uh, hear her. I can't. Yes. So we can hear her. Can... Now I can hear you. Go for it. I'm happy. Now... Okay. I have a question that's been on my mind for quite a while. And um, I know Esau, I think, founded Edom. Right. And Edom. I was curious and I looked it up. Edom uh, was in what is now Jordan. Is Southern that... Jordan. Yes. Yeah. So how does Edom or Esau and Edom uh, connect to Greece and Rome, especially to Rome? Okay. The story to get to Rome is a long story, but we, we I'll shorten it up for you. Okay. There's a war that goes on in Egypt. The Egyptians are at battle with Esau's people. The Egyptians are losing, and the, the Jews that were with them went on to defeat Esau's people. They captured a son. The son that they captured, they brought back and put in prison. They wanted to, to kill him, but the Pharaoh said, no, he's good for bargaining. Well, he escapes from prison, and he goes to Carthage which is in Northern Africa, and okay. he crosses the Mediterranean. Now, in his crossing of the Mediterranean, he becomes a part of the Roman story because his real name is Eliphaz, but in, in Rome, he will be known as Romulus. Oh, that, that's, that's um, Esau's son. Yes. Eliphaz. Yeah, oh. son, and his son is the one who actually founds it, but he's a member of the Edomites. So therefore, that is their understanding. That's why they constantly say that the United States is Rome, because of the European, Indo-European languages. Yes, well, Rome um, is greatly influenced the Western world and like, and very Europe. Much, very much a materialistic society. Yes, totally. Wow. Okay. Also, I just wanted to make a little comment that I saw on the news. I don't know if you all saw the terrorist attack in Israel recently. And I just thought we could keep them in our prayers. Well, the interesting place where the attack occurred, and this is now what uh, nine days ago, is at a place called Kiryat Araba. Kiryat Araba is the original name of this city. It's the city where Abraham lived in a sub-community called Mamre. Hebron is that city. Wow. So the things that are going on there, the Jews that live in Hebron live in the suburb called Kiryat Araba. That takes you back all the way to the Old Testament, all the way back to, to the days of Abraham. Wow. That's how old that community is. I see. Well, this, this they said, just happened, unless I'm wrong, I think just happened, was it yesterday or something? And it was in a bus that was, there was a bomb or something, or explosion and, and a terrorist attack. I don't know if that's the same one you're- No, oh. but that, that goes along with it. Where was oh. the bus? Where was the bus headed? I'm not sure. Hebron. Oh. Once a year, there are, during the week of Sarah's Parsha, uh -huh. Jews will go in armored buses down to to Kiryat Arba to the tomb of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to mock. Oh. So the destruction of the bus was to tell us, or to tell the world, this isn't where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are buried. This is where Abraham, Esau, 
and uh, his son. Okay, why am I not thinking of it? Not Eliphaz. There's another son, but anyway. So there's three buried there, but they're not they're not the three that you're thinking of. So they war over this place. Oh boy! So it's it's a very controversial place. The the little community that's there lives with a armor brigade surrounding them in order to keep them safe. And one of the school teachers walked into their area and began shooting his AK-47 and began killing people. That's and terrible. the bus ride coming in coincides with the, the week of Sarah and the Parsha. Oh, wow. So this is a biblical war. Yes, definitely. So. Anything else I can help you with? No, that's everything. Thanks. Good. Sandy, what do you think? Well, um, I came across something kind of interesting when I was reading the portion earlier in the week, and it's Genesis 25, 28. And it says, Isaac loved, past tense, Esau, for he put game in his mouth, but Rebecca loves, present tense, Jacob. So with my limited ability to read Hebrew, I, it looked to me like the first one was past tense and the second present, but I emailed Rabbi Wolby and asked him about it. If it's an accurate translation, what's the significance of past tense versus present tense? And he replied, I'm going to just read his reply. It's short. Okay. It, it, is an, it is an accurate translation. I read some of the commentaries, and one of them, it explains that Rebecca's love for Jacob was stronger than Isaac's love for Esau. Rebecca actively loved Jacob at all times, whereas Isaac only loved Esau passively. Oh, that was very interesting. You kind of touched on it a little bit when you said Isaac loved him because of the, the good foods and the things he would bring him. But Rebecca had a more um maybe a higher level of a love i don't know how to uh, any Absolutely. other way to say it but more the spiritual side which of is, it which is why I, I side with the fact that grandpa abraham probably did more to keep esau in line for those first 15 years of his life than we could ever possibly know and but, uh, i don't know how many times i've read that and just this time it jumped out isaac loved but Rebecca loves, and I thought that was kind of interesting. But, yeah, which started me down my track, which, yeah, I, I didn't spend much time talking about it, but that's, it, I don't know, from a principal's point of view, this is a very common story, and that's the sad part. It's a common story. I love him. He loves him. Families are divided quite easily in our day and age, and it's uh it's very heartbreaking when you're trying to work with kids and, and they come back and they tell you that my parents don't love me. And you go through the questioning, well, how, why do you think that? And they give you all kinds of reasons why. And you have to, you sit there quietly and you listen and then you try to come up with something to say to them that will encourage them. And uh, that's why in my last few years of teaching, I was told I couldn't hug my kids. I was told I couldn't give them a high five. No touching because that that brings on lawsuits. But what was it that these kids needed more than anything else? They needed that personal touch of love. Otherwise, they had none of it. In fact, I had one mother come walking up to me and she says, you will not hug my son. He climbs out of the car immediately walks over and gives me the biggest hug that he could possibly have and almost knocked me to the ground. After that, she just looked and she shook her head and drove away. But it was a rather interesting conversation. So, yeah, there are too many people hurting. I, I just, the marriage, it, it was nice that he married a younger woman. But I think three years old might have been a little too young to be marrying her. And uh, the fact that they never really did grow to be the couple, not like the 10 years that separated Abraham and Sarah. Well, I, I 
did read some commentary on that where she tells when Jacob is concerned that if Isaac discovers they're trying, you know, got this plot going on. And she says, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, the curse will be on me. And I read a commentary that said she could confidently say that because of the prophecy that Shem had given her that she knew there wasn't going to be a curse come down on her because this Jacob was the one that was intended to have all of this. And she was, it, but, and the reason she did, according to this commentary, the reason she didn't tell Isaac is that it was given to her privately and she was not given permission to tell it to Isaac. Um, that it was just given to her personally what was going on with the two boys. But she, in a way, she, I guess from her point of view, and I, and I tend to agree with it, that she she didn't feel like she was being deceitful or doing anything wrong. She had been told that this is the way that it's got to play out. Yeah, but there again, you, you're going to violate your husband by listening to this other man I, I you're absolutely correct i mean she she was told not to tell and it, it just seemingly leads to this further differences between the two they're they're holding back from each other and, and you know not that i'm this the one who speaks out a lot my wife will explain to you that i'm the strong silent type also but the the idea is that there's still communication and and i think that was one of the things that really was lacking in their marriage and and i've seen several of uh, stories that deal with the this differences between the two in a family relationship in fact i think it's in this week's parsha in the family relationships and it's it, it's it's telling us that we got as family, we got to love our kids equally, which is not easy. And not only that, we have to love them based on what they're going to be and who they want to be. Now, we don't want them to be a gangster, but at the same point in time, we want them to grow to be their best that they can possibly be. And so that's that's kind of what I think is a spin-off of, of our stories here. It, it, it's how relationships should go and and communications between them. Mary, you got something? Yeah. Um, but first, I want to say how much I'm enjoying what Sandy brought out. Oh, wait a second. I, I, I could have said that too, but she did it before me. And I appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, you're talking about family relationships. It it reminds me that uh, when my mother died, uh, those those of us that were still alive, we were talking, and each one of us felt like we were her favorite. And we didn't have a lot growing up, but Mom did teach us about love. Yeah. I can remember when my older sister was a teenager, she uh, ran away from home. And mom sat and cried all afternoon and prayed. And finally, in the evening, she got up and grabbed her car keys and headed out the door. And I said, wait, mom, where are you going? And she said, I'm going to bring my daughter home. And... Uh, I said, well, you don't know where she's at. And she said, she's my daughter. I know exactly where she's at. So she went and bringing her home, she stopped at a red light. And my sister got out of the car, jumped out of the car and hid. And uh, she told me later, she said, I watched mom go up and down the road, up and down the road, searching for me. Well, then my sister took off running and got home before mom did. And she cried and begged mom's forgiveness. And she told me later, she said, I don't know why I did that. Mother loves me so much. But you're talking about that just brought that memory back. But the thing I originally wanted to say was that in your notes, you talked about how he did the bow and arrow and cut his throat. I couldn't understand that. I'm glad you clarified that for me. Uh, that's uh, 
pretty interesting uh, um, in piece of information. Well, it also tells you that there was a lot more in the oral stories than we ever possibly could understand, that they were already practicing kosher eating. I also read uh, in the Zohar when uh, Esau said, uh, well, good's the birthright to me. I'll die anyway. In the Zohar, it said that he, because he had sit in the uh, in the meeting and learned Torah before he was fifteen, that he knew that if you didn't do the sacrifices right and your heart wasn't right, that that you would die. And that that's what he was really referring to. I thought that was pretty interesting. Another way of looking at it. That's the interesting thing about Hebrew. There's 70 ways to look at anything. Keep finding in things. In Christianity, we lived with, this is it. This is the way it is. Be done with it. That's not the way it works. Not the way God works anyway. Go ahead. Kelly, you want to add another thing? Yeah. <laughs> I remember you can only add two things in any one night. You can't, you can't, that's, never mind. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'm kidding. Oh, okay. Um, you, did you say that Rebecca was three years old when she married Isaac? Yep. Oh my gosh. How could that, but, but didn't Rebecca bring water for the camels and for, yeah. and how, how many how much water does a camel drink? I'm sure probably a lot. 10 like, gallons. Whoa. 10 okay. gallons times 10 camels plus, mm -hmm. and she's three. How would she do that? I don't have the faintest idea. Wow. Mary knows. The Zohar <laughs> says that the water miraculously lifted up. Wow. So. Well, I'm sure children back then had, they were a lot more, probably had more chores than like nowadays, oh, yeah. you know, and things. Yes. Well, well, why would you send a three-year-old down by a well in the first place? She went down there to get water for her family. Wow. Wow. At three years old. <laughs> it just blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah, three years old, I wouldn't let my kid out of my sight. But anyway, she, she that's the difference in times and traditions, I'm sure. Go ahead, Sandy. Thanks. Well, I'm glad Kelly brought that up because that has bothered me from the very beginning when I've read that in commentary and heard, heard that in other classes. And I have read a commentary that said, uh, <laughs> thanks, Alex, <laughs> um, that maybe we shouldn't take that literally, that she was as pure as a three-year-old. And to me, I can kind of get on board with that because if you think about not just being able to deal with all that water and do all of that, but when this strange man shows up at their house and gives this three-year-old jewelry and all of this and says, I want to take her back with me and her mother and brothers say well um rebecca do you want to go would you let a three-year-old make that kind of a decision all of those things factored in there makes me not want to take that three-year-old idea literally now i that's just my opinion which means absolutely nothing uh, but i just just have a hard time getting on that she was literally three i i like that Oh, my wife is agreeing with you. So stop talking. <laughs> Anybody else have something good to say? Well, I was. That was good. Now two people want to talk. Go ahead, Mary, you first. I was just going to say that you have to remember, too, that when it says they were married, it doesn't mean they had consummated a marriage. Kelly, you want to chime in again? Hello? Oh, Alex? Yeah. You got something to add? Yeah, I have something to add. Um, <clears throat> I hope it, it goes right. Um, it says here, 
that when the day were prolonged, I'm trying to read from Spanish, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Uh, Avimelech saw that uh, by, um, from his window that Itzhak was um, laughing with Rika, his wife. Now, where did you, where is this from? This is from um, chapter 26, verse 8. Huh. Okay, that's the, that's the Rachel story, right? 36.8? No, it's when there's a famine and Isaac wants to go to Egypt. Oh, that's right. Well, okay. No, you can't go to Egypt. So he goes to the Philistines and, and he does the same thing. He tells them Rebecca is his sister. But evidently, Abimelech sees them behaving in a way that says, I don't think that's your sister. Nope. Yes, you're absolutely right. That's an interesting thought. My I thing is that um, after that, it says that Isaac on verse 12 um, did his land and did a uh, hundred times more because Hashem um, blessed him. Um, yes. I, I don't know um, how to make the question because it's going to sound hard, but. Um, it um, it's kind of uh, contradictory the way I see it. Um, that it doesn't seem, not from my point of view, from this verse, that there, there were so many um, hard situations um, between the marriage. There, there's no um, significance if there's many problems in the marriage to bring this in the Torah. Uh, it, it's just a thought. Um, um, yeah. um, I, I won't um, take it as a question. I'm not. <laughs> well, that's fine. You know, that's, Alex, I'm glad you spoke up. There's so much in the text, so many verses to look at, so many places that you're trying to piece together a picture. I talk about putting a picture in my sanctified imagination. I try to take all of the scriptures and then try to, well, like tonight, lay out a historical path from beginning to end. But I obviously didn't get to the end. I didn't, I didn't go this far. There's there's so much in the in the Torah. Okay. That's why I love Genesis because I could spend the entire year studying Genesis. <laughs> there's so much here love it too and it, and it all pertains to me how i treat my wife is here i don't have to go anywhere else and that's not one of the seven laws but it deals with the idea of kindness and how one should act towards others and, and alex you're absolutely right there's there's just a lot of interesting things going back to esau having blessings on the mountain According to this, to the stories in the Midrash, Mount Ser was a mountain where you could taste the soil and whatever it tasted like, you could grow it. Imagine if you wanted a rhubarb. Awesome. Yeah. Imagine if you wanted carrots. Imagine any plant. You could plant it on this mountain and that's what you would grow. You can imagine that. Amazing. Go, yeah. go further into time. Go to Solomon. Solomon was supposed to be able to grow every tree in the world, every Amazing. vegetable in the world. Esau was like Solomon in that way. Now I've got to go and figure out how was Esau like Solomon? What was those first 15 years like? What did he actually learn? What did he know? And not only that, Mount Seir wasn't even his property. He stole it. It belonged to another nation altogether. He took it away from him and made it his own. And for that, he's going to be judged according to Obadiah 121. There'll be a judgment on Esau for, doing, for taking that mountain. There's a lot of stories that are just chuck full of th things. That's why I constantly read the Midrash. I got to go find stories to help me build my pictures. And same thing, you're building stories without it. I, I, I'm amazed and impressed. That's cool.
thank you very much uh, for this class. I, I enjoy it like uh, amazingly a lot. Thank you very much for your hard well, work. Thank, thanks, Sandy, for getting on and putting me on. Otherwise, because we weren't supposed to teach this week, but I, I just felt like there was something here that we needed to teach. So it's it's all on Sandy's fault. So it's, send your cards and your curses to Sandy and leave me alone. Oh. Anyway, no. You're kidding. I am kidding. Um, one more thing, and uh, what you said about the mountain and what you wanted it to be, that's what it was. Tie that in with the manna, that supposedly that whatever you wanted it to taste like, that's what it would taste like. If you wanted it to taste like steak, it would taste like steak or whatever. So that's kind of a recurring theme, seems like. Yes, it is. And it's, again, miracles that we do not see. They're the, uh, they're, well, Aunt Manna is told, but the, the miracle of Solomon and his, and his hills, or the miracle of, of Mount Seir, those are untold miracles. Those are untold stories. That's the fascinating thing about it. There's so much richness here. It's just, it's mind boggling. You know, I've kept you 20 minutes late. I hope you didn't mind being on for that long. If not, it is a good night. And it's a good night to say happy Thanksgiving and may you and your family have a great one this year. So I'm glad I got to be on so I can tell you that. So next week, I'll tell you Merry Christmas. But right now, I'll just, I'll just stick to Thanksgiving. Happy okay. Thanksgiving to you, too. You, too. Y'all have Shalom. a great night. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.